want to pivot a little bit and get you to think about how how did you help your 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 children endure and maybe even build their resistance and inoculation to some of the negative elements of society that are constantly combating them whether if it whether it's a peer group or negative destructive images i i i read a book while i was at morehouse uh by haki a booty called black men single obsolete and dangerous now, when i took my uh, black men's course and so we were dealing with how to combat that and even i was as a as an as a young adult and we're just trying to get you know they 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 wear t-shirts obey your thirst do what you like do whatever you want to do how did you what did you do in your parenting to help your children navigate that successfully well, we can start with uh, okay go ahead Deidre. <laughs> um i i always looked at the peer um aspect and, 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 and some of this came uh, from, of course, the boys club, you know, a friend will never lead you to danger. Mm -hmm. So I began to talk with Amari very early about what a friend is, what a friend looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's not about what people think of you, you know, and if someone doesn't want to be around you, it's their loss and that sort of thing, those kind of conversations, because I didn't want him to to have his identity tied to what people thought of him mm -hmm. and have that dictate behavior, mm -hmm. you know? So I just started early with having that kind of conversation with him. And, and I would also um, just, just in the simple, in the simple things, we'd be watching Charlie Brown mm -hmm. and the Lucy taking the football away from Charlie Brown so he would fall and all that kind of stuff. You know, we I would pause it and I would talk about that. What kind of friend is Lucy? You know, um, do you want a friend like that? Do you want, you know, and and how how do you think about Charlie Brown? You know, do you think that you know he has confidence? You think, you know, I mean, just talking about things. And I I saw or realized how things begin to stick when. There was a young lady that um, he loved to play with in elementary school, Jenna. Remember Jenna? <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I remember he used to talk about her all the time. And then there was a period where he wasn't talking about her. And I asked, how's things with Jenna? And he was like, we're not friends anymore. And I, why? Because she started being mean to me. Mm. So, you know, um, I think that when we yes start young or at any point really talking to our kids and just that constant engagement um about just people life how do you react how should you react it's going to impact how they respond when they're in when they have to face those situations you know um so often we're just busy with making sure they get clothed and we have a roof over their head, but just converse, just having those conversations and just making it seem like, oh, it's just nothing. And then it, you'd be amazed at what comes out when they actually have to encounter something. So um, that kind of helped, I think, buffer some things, you know, where regardless of what everybody else is doing and just things from when he, I'm always been in high school, he would say to me, you know, um, the class clowns, you know, he just kind of look at them like, you know, he was, he didn't want to be like them. He didn't want to um, join in he wanted to hear what the teacher had to say mm. and just kind of separated himself from from what he didn't want mm. you know and i think that that just starts with conversations thank you dial we thought i saw you unmuted too yeah i mean i, I would definitely agree with deidre it's uh certainly conversations um timely ones and relevant ones and um, for me, I would highlight things that were taking place. 
mm-hmm. you know, on a day-to-day basis from a national perspective and, and mm-hmm. sometimes a global perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that their awareness was there. Um, and uh, it changes with time. Mm-hmm. I remember sitting in a church service with my daughters and after church, you know, typical questions. What'd you think? You know, how was it? Mm-hmm. Uh, one daughter responded, uh, you know, yeah, I didn't really do much. I didn't really like it. Mm. Okay, well, why? You know, and she proceeded to tell me that she basically thought that the lesson that particular Sunday was sexist. Mm. And I um, heard that from her and received that, you know, and told her, okay, maybe it was. So now what are you going to do about it? Mm-hmm. And that really was the positioning I took in a lot of instances with my daughters is that, you know, the reality may be that, you know, society is against you in many different facets and areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's not where the focus should be on how many we can identify, I mean, you know, issues we can take. It's more so, okay, how, how are you going to respond? You know, my response was not, this is what, what I would do. It was more to position to her to say, you know, and however you may read or perceive and, you know, interpret um, the word or even your own God, you know, um, and society in general, you know, what decisions are you going to make mm-hmm. going forward? Um, hmm. And uh, I, I've been, you know, pleased to see both my daughters have grown to be, you know, some wonderful young ladies, very independent in thought. Um, I think very empathetic as well, and very aware. Uh, they don't always share, you know, um, what they're thinking, feeling at times. Uh, so those are areas that as a parent, I'll continue to try to, you know, work on and mm-hmm. foster. Um, but similarly too, as, as Deidre said, you know, you've got to be transparent as much as you can as a parent. And uh, I would say consistency for me. Was a, was a big one. Me um, always being, you know, what they've known and who they, who've they, who they know, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I think for that reason, there wasn't much that anyone else could speak to in terms of determining the relationships that they had mm-hmm. with me as a parent or their mm-hmm. friends or whomever. Um, it allowed them to really understand that they make and create their own relationships. Mm. It can't be defined by anyone else. Their perception can't be defined by anyone else. So that was something that um, I was I was told you know, fairly early on when they were young and um, mm. emphasized by my father as well, in discussions mm. with him. Mm. And I've, I've found that that's been the most beneficial problem. Wow, thank you. Mama Rita, when Dial was talking, I noticed you look like you had some thoughts. So I wanna bring the conversation back around to the wisdom (laughs) in the space. And as Mama Rita, I know you mentioned a live, you mentioned the boys club. So um, as that was a resource, you talked about being open and willing because some parents won't reach out. out of fear that someone may, out of fear of the positionality of maybe the people their kids develop relationships with. Mm-hmm. Um, but you actually tapped into the community resources. Yeah. And you said, you, when you became concerned about peer pressure in relation to your oldest daughter, you said, okay, it's time for me to reach out and get some help. So can you, maybe we can pick up from there. Okay. Um, yes. Um, but yeah, but Daya was saying it, it reminded me a lot of my husband. And I realized in my last conversation, I hadn't mentioned him and he was a big force in, um, you know, keeping me balanced, uh, keeping us balanced, uh, mm-hmm. through, uh, the ups and downs of our parenting. And, um, a lot of what he said reminds me of some of the things that my husband has said to me over the years, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> that, um, you know, help um, me not be so emotional or, you know, so um, 
you know, out there with whatever fears that I had and everything, mm -hmm. he would always, you know, say we put good stuff, we've given them good tools, you know, mm -hmm. uh, he reminded me that, yeah, you take them to the boys club and I could mm -hmm. see the effect that it was having on them. And, mm -hmm. you know, so he was a big part of keeping us stable mm -hmm. and um, having, you know, both ends, um, you know, me being sometime overly emotional and him being more the rock like, you know, yeah. and having faith that it was going to be OK. Now, some of the things that Dio said, though, that my husband lacked was his father's input. So he was kind of going on, you know, what he would have wanted as a father, you know, and. Um, but it was good, you know, it yeah. was good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we felt that, like, um, I think Deidre was saying about the consistency, mm -hmm. consistency was very important, you know, to us, that they had friends that they grew up with, mm -hmm. um, and um, that uh, we knew that, that they knew that what we felt about them was love and that they were very important to us. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I know you said you wanted to talk about uh, the structure. Well, and... actually, I think you you hit it. You um, this was really helpful. What you just said was really helpful because it it helped. You brought the importance of the um, the the marital relationship into the conversation, and you you brought in the having your husband there and reminding you and being that constant reminder of um, what you've already instilled in your children. And when you said that, it reminded me that that's what my husband has been to me is remind we we're able to talk and he can remind me that you, when I'm, when things are chaotic or when I become afraid or fearful or get concerned, we're able to do that for each other. Sometimes I have to remind him, remember what you reminded me? <laughs> so, so sometimes we have to do that. And I love, I actually appreciate the turn you took with the conversation because that's helped. We're actually going to go to Corinne because Corinne is also married, but younger. So Corinne, um, top five key issues facing Black America, okay? That's lack of family structure, violence, a fragmented perspective on economic empowerment, victim mindset, and over-criminalization of Black men and women. You have a son, you have a young son and you have who's elementary age and you have a high schooler. How are you helping them make sense of the emergence of violence? And I can't even say emergence. It, it's been this way. So how are you helping them make sense and navigate? Um, we've been hearing this word fear a lot, right? How are you doing it? How are you managing your concerns about that? violence and over-criminalization and how are you helping them? Um, well, they probably are so tired of me talking and talking and talking and showing examples and going to exhibits and all this stuff. So mm -hmm. as we all know, the over-criminalization of black boys and girls in schools and the community is not new, it's historic and it's in the fabric of America. It really makes up really what America is about in terms of our interracial and racial issues. Um, and so we've seen it since after slavery with Jim Crow, we've seen it with convict leasing, we've seen it after the, 90, 90, the 1994 crime bill with the huge, huge increase in mass incarceration. So we've seen this, like this is not new. So when people are having conversations about it and like I'm right now I work for the Homeless Advocacy Project and they're talking about 
um, starting um, an equity group that will start having these conversations and how we can start engaging people. I'm so tired of having these conversations and mm -hmm. trying to engage somebody and using trigger words like equity and inclusion mm -hmm. and diversity mm -hmm. and all these performative action things that people are doing in and out of the community. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I do with my children that I do with myself, I do with anybody that's willing to listen is to educate them and, in, and inform them. Like you, mm -hmm. so even no matter what the subject is, whether it's over criminalization, whether it's making your children confident, whether it's teaching them independence, whatever it is, it requires a level of education. They yes. need to know who they are and whose they are. They need to know where all this stuff is rooted so that yes. they're not internalizing it and making it and, it, and them feeling like it's them. So for my son and for my daughter, I don't want them to feel like, oh, they did something wrong. And that's why the police stopped them. There are occasions where people do do things wrong. But I live in East Oakland where we're over policed, we're over criminalized, where young girls are over sexualized in school, out of school. Um, I'm right off of International, which is like the mecca for sex trafficking, human trafficking. Um, our community is plagued with drugs plagued with medic, um, you know, mental health issues, poverty. They recently just closed the Walgreens, which was the only source of yeah. food really yeah. well right here in the community is like our, their grocery store. So we're in like a food desert and all of these things. So I tell my children, this is not coincidental. This is strategic. And when people speak to institutional and, uh, you know, institutional racism, um, even with COVID, with healthcare, with education, with zoning, with housing, this is not coincidental. So I'll make sure my kids understand that um, and that they know that this is historic and this has been our lineage since we've been here. This is not who we are because we come from a great line of great people, um, but this is how we've been defined in America. But that doesn't mean that it has to define you. So um, I always talk to them about our history, about who we are, about what criminalization looks like, because sometimes it's overt, sometimes it's covert, sometimes uh, it's hush hush, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's not deliberate and in your face. Sometimes mm -hmm. they just close a Walgreens and you think they just closed the store. Mm -hmm. So um, so I talk to them and the, we spend a lot of time in the car because we're, we're there back in school. So they're commuting to school and then pick up. So we have what's called car chronicles where something may come on on the radio or my daughter might say something or my son might say something and it triggers an emotional, you know, uh, uh, emotions out of me. It triggers a conversation that will segue into something else. And I always try to leave them with some type of life piece or something that they can take away from that. And I'm confident that a lot of it goes through one ear and out the other. Um, but as we all have spoken before about the spiritual foundation, the Bible says, you know, uh, train up a child in the way they should go and they won't stray from it. Now they might go and depart and do different things, but they'll come back to it. So it's important that I'm dropping those seeds and I'm planting those seeds um, because it's not them. We can change laws, we can change bills, we can do those things, but we can't change the psychosis. We can't change the mentality of the fact that uh, that our European you know, counterparts believe that we are subservient to them. They believe that we need to be over criminalized because they think that they believe that we don't know how to behave. They believe that we can't manage ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so they think that they're doing us a service. And there's actually a phrase called the white man's burden where they feel like it's a burden to them because they have to police us, because they have to monitor us. They have to educate us. And, and for a lack of better words, civilize us because we're savages. Mm -hmm. um, and so I talk to my kids about these things. And anytime some come on the radio, on the news, anything, they can count that I'm gonna bring these things to their attention because it's the reality. And so I try to stay away from, um, well, I teach them make sure they know their rights. But as we've seen, knowing your rights is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, Minding your business is not enough. Being in your home and, and doing the right thing is not enough. So it's not always a matter of whether you're doing the right thing or not. It's really a matter of knowing where we stand when it comes to a particular group of people. And I'm not saying that to them to traumatize them or to make them feel like, you know, all white people are bad or anything like that. But they have to be aware of the fact that he's a black boy in East Oakland, in America, um, and these stigmas and stereotypes follow him wherever he go. So I, I want him to be educated. With education comes confidence. 
um, comes that self-assertiveness and um, self-awareness um, that he's going to need while he's navigating through, you know, the streets and through America, et cetera. Um, and then one thing I just wanted to mention in terms of just raising your kids um, in, in our current climate um, and also with all these other influences like, you know, obey your thirst and things like that. Um, they need to, my kids need to know and other kids need to know that the popular choice isn't always the best choice. So even mm-hmm. though it's popular, even though it's trending and everybody's doing it, when it comes to integrity, that's a matter of doing the right thing when no one is around and having that in you and knowing that. So with my daughter and my son, you got to know who you are, know what you're about, know what's okay and what's not okay. Know what triggers you, know what makes you feel some type of way, whether it's coming from me, whether it's coming from a friend, even from a teacher, because we are being criminalized and over-sexualized in schools. So even though they're there to teach us and to educate us, they have their own personal biases and, and, you know, stereotypes as well. So I have them bring all that to the table. And even the the teachers and everyone, they're all part of my village. So I give my kids therapy as well, because being black, it, it, it has inherent, you know, trauma. So, so the therapist is part of my village as well, but they need to know that it's always safe to come to me and talk about anything you need to talk about. Even if I have a dissenting opinion, even if I don't agree and I teach them, you, everyone's not going to agree with you. Mm -hmm. Everyone's not going to understand where you're coming from. They need to just respect it. You know, the, the goal is just have mutual respect for people, even though we all have different opinions and different, you know, views. You need to just let them know that you respect that and you show them that you respect that through your actions. So really, you know, I went off on a tangent, but that's how it kind of, you know, it, it leads to that because it's really emotional for me because we've all experienced it. We see it yeah. in the news. We yeah. see it with our families. We see it yeah. everywhere we go. We see it with COVID and how it's having a disproportional effect on Black people. We see it in healthcare, we see it in education, in zoning, in housing, public housing. We see it in the criminal justice system with these felonies. Now you can't get public assistance. Now you can't get education. And so that's really strategic in a way to keep us in a particular box and in a particular community. And all these things are interconnected um, and they all genuinely affect us all. And so that's why I, I have all these conversations with my children all the time, so. I'll, I'll stop, but yeah. Karen, I just want to say you came out the gate with fire <laughs> on this topic. As you were speaking, I was getting chills, Yeah, really. And I, uh, I, I wrote a couple of comments down. You said you mentioned car chronicle conversations. And I love that t- uh, term. I remember my mom's birthday was a couple of days ago and mm-hmm. she's not living anymore. Mm-hmm. But all that I am, I owe to my mom. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't have car conversations, but we had kitchen table conversations. Mm-hmm. And I would sit, as I remember being a child sitting in this high chair, and she's telling me, and, and this is what you're going to do, and this is what you're not going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we didn't have the car conversations, but we did have them kitchen table conversations when we I can remember on Easter making eggs and getting lectured <laughs> so I got lectured every day of my life from child <laughs> to teenager <laughs> but it but it made the difference I, I wish I could growing hear them now East Oakland, I right? wish I grew up because I grew up in East Oakland I grew up in Brookfield Village all right so I know everything you're talking about firsthand mm-hmm. um and I and there was something that also that you mentioned and, it, and I wrote this concept down uh, that you you were purposefully helping them build their world view without apology mm-hmm. through mm-hmm. the car conversations, car chronicles, through, through the car chronicles, <laughs> through the film study that di- um, uh, that um, Deidre. Deidre was mm-hmm. talking about mm-hmm. film study, mm-hmm. and so uh, I just wanted to say that. Let's go ahead and yeah. and uh, yeah. move to the next part. So Deidre. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Now we you you heard a lot, um, and uh, like Chris just said, Corinne came out the gate. She came okay. out the gate. She did Love because it. yes, um, she came right out the gate from the beginning history. And I wrote a, a little diagram here, and I started history, the system victimizing entitlement dependence. And then I put an arrow once Corinne started to speak. This is what happens when we don't have car chronicles. Mm. That's right. When we don't have car chronicles, we are victims. 
which leads to entitlement. Mm -hmm. And so when we have this, this history, the things that um, Corinne was talking about when, when they are internalized, mm -hmm. when we do, when, when, when our children don't have the guidance and, and anyone speaking to them or while they're sitting in the high chair, mm -hmm. you know, talking to them, mm -hmm. then with everything that the, this, the system weighs down on, on us, it's internalized. And so we walk through life, we are victim and you owe me something. Somebody owes me something. And if, I, if they don't give it to me, then I need to take it, something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that mentality, unfortunately is shaped, yes, by our society. I mean, left, left alone, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's where we come in as parents knowing this to have the car chronicles mm -hmm. so that we can we can um, deflect, we can guard against this. No, you are going to be somebody. You are already somebody. The, word, the, the society, the system doesn't see it that way, but you are already somebody. You just need to go ahead and internalize that and then walk that out in life. And and, and that's, as, again, as Corinne was talking, it's just like, yeah, the connection. I could just, this, that, this is what's happening when we don't have the parenting that so many of our kids need. And so many parents are under pressures, yes, because again, we have our system in place where all I need to do is just work this job and pay these bills and get this roof and get these clothes on these kids back, get these kids something to eat, get them off the school. And we're missing a whole bunch of stuff. You know, because of because we just got so much to do, but there are these moments that we gotta find the high chair. You know, cooking, cook, making those eggs in the car. We gotta find those moments, and this is just not okay, y'all. Just leave me alone. Yes, we need our moments, but we have to understand. We have to look at the at the bigger picture with our children because there's so much against us. There's that's that's just been. We gotta look at the bigger picture. We got to find these moments and, and give it to them, mm -hmm. you know, and be, yeah, do, do all that we've already been talking about because this is how we get to where we are right now on uh, uh, sharing about Black parenting. We had to get here, mm -hmm. each of us. So we want our kids to get here and beyond. And this is how we do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're victims mm. and that's what we live out. And that's, that's what we're seeing in the news and, 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 and every other awful story or awful decision a young person is making. This, this is why, this is how, you know? And of course we can talk about when we take God away, of course, you know, because this is how, this is, that's the foundation as to why we're here right now in our right minds. You know, mm. we remove all of that this is what we have. What we have is what we have. We get, we put in car chronicles, you know, which includes talking about God and talking about that relationship with God so that they will, even if they go straight from it, they can come back to it. We talk about that. We set, we, we set that foundation. Then again, they can be where we are now and beyond mm -hmm. and doing the same thing and fostering that, mm -hmm. fostering this mm -hmm. and how to. You know, so absolutely. Thank you, Corinne. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the energy you bring <laughs> to this conversation. So when a child is left to themselves, then society shapes who they are. When a child is left to themselves, then society shapes who they are and that's a victim mm. Dio there's a lot of talk about black economic empowerment <clears throat> as the answer to addressing the deprivation we see facing the community and have seen for decades for centuries, <laughs> we've seen economic deprivation devastate Black communities. Talk to us about your perspective 
on economic empowerment and what you've taught your daughters about what that means and the value that it brings, the value that it can bring to the Black community? Right. Well, um, my daughters are certainly still learning. Let me first say that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the job's not yet done. Um, but I, I would say uh, this is consistent with what Corinne spoke to and Deidre spoke to and Mama Rita as well in regards to their awareness. You know, they have to first be able to um, be able to see mm -hmm. all of those threats. And I emphasize both my daughters pretty early on, right? That first rule of nature, first law of nature, which is just self-preservation. And as a father, um, they knew that I worked in the marketing industry. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them my job, mm -hmm. my job was to protect them. Mm -hmm. And they can distinguish that. Um, so from an economic perspective, I think um, both of them have an understanding of um, the oppression that mm -hmm. communities are uh, subjected to. Mm -hmm. Those who don't have a voice or don't have a pow uh, power in particular. So uh, we often talk about resources. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what brings about power? What brings about some authority? And, you know, also what was important to me as a father was understanding, uh, you know, who, excuse me, I get me emotional, who, who uh, comprised your community? you know, as, as kids. So, um, you know, looking at their peer groups and choices the peer groups make. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we can speak a lot to these children too, uh, but they're gonna learn a lot through observation, yeah. whether it's uh, things that we intend to occur or, uh, you know, things that are totally unplanned and learn how they're gonna respond to them. Uh, sometimes it is hindsight that we can speak to something. Mm -hmm. um, there was a child that uh, you know, took his own life, you know, mm -hmm. my children's school at one point. These are things that are unplanned, right? But we can discuss them um, after the fact to some degree. So for me, first it was their understanding their sense of community. And then, you know, where are our resources within that? Mm -hmm. You know, I want a daughter who you know, truly early on, pre-K, and kindergarten, first grade, love to read more than playing with toys, right? And so we continue to foster that mm -hmm. as she grew a bit older. And having, for me, uh, a, a social group and community around me that when they encounter my children, meet them, ask, you know, well, what's a good book you read recently, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so them now knowing that those are gonna be some of their expectations, that they encounter dad's social group. And these are the questions mm -hmm. that may be posed to them. Mm -hmm. They understand they've got to be on point too. They've got to have had a book they can respond to and be able to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding that, you know, resources are found everywhere that can help us and then internalize and analyze how they can be a benefit economically as well. Mm -hmm. I, um, I have, uh, children, as you, know, you all know, you know, we have a split household. Mm -hmm. So I divorced their mother over 10 years ago now. Uh, and so in some ways, they're insulated from things that I was not so insulated from as a child. And so understanding that they're coming from a different perspective and what they see and view, you know, is, is what they know. Um, it's going to have the same impact. So um, interestingly, we talk about resources and we'll talk about like, film and the car conversations. I recall playing or having them watch uh, Fruitvale Station, mm. right? Prior to them going back to Oakland, right? Mm -hmm. um, because for me, as much as I could talk about things, there had to in some sense be an emotional connection. I thought that film created that mm -hmm. and how they perceive young black men Mm -hmm. My children at the time had made some uh, remarks to that that didn't quite sit well with me. And I wanted to ensure that they were given a broad scope of cause and effect and uh, understanding circumstance of individuals that they may not in themselves even encounter. Um, mm -hmm. So 
that awareness was important to me. And then we could begin to talk about um, working, the joys of working and earning your own money and what to do with it, how to be responsible with that, um, and, and seeing and, and hearing what's important to them. So uh, they're both uh, extremely empathetic children mm-hmm. and they have their own uh, like kind of causes that they champion. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I found this generation in general, like they care. Yeah, you know, they do care about things. They do care about people. Um, they tend to care more about this planet than we have, right? In our generation, the generations before us. Mm-hmm. I recall walking out of a restaurant with them at one point. Uh, they were probably like five, six, you know, at the most. And there, two of them, both of them behind me walking. And as soon as we exit. And there's a gentleman out front. And he's out front outside the restaurant smoking a cigarette. They immediately, you know, walk a lot with their, you know, fingers up. And, you know, it's just something that they learned in school for this particular generation mm-hmm. where they would chastise me, dad, when I toss something out the window driving. You know, how could you litter? So those things that are important to them, they have to also understand that, uh, you know, there's, there's finances that make things happen. Mm-hmm. Right, that we have all these nonprofits, mm-hmm. um, you know, charitable organizations in place, Everything. you know, to hopefully reach a particular outcome and address mm-hmm. issues that exist in our society, some of which they will feel dear to themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's one of the core aspects is the understanding of who our community is, mm-hmm. what is important to you, and the importance of also then giving back. Right. Of, uh, you know, addressing those issues with your dollars, as well as your time, your effort and your information that we we consume. Um, So, you know, I I worked in marketing and specifically in entertainment marketing. Mm -hmm. So my children have had an opportunity to sit VIP Mm -hmm. right, and look down on those free seats that, Mm -hmm. you know, the cheap seats that, you know, I grew up hoping that, you know, Golden State Warriors would give us some tickets to the game so I could go, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so they've seen to some degree privilege, right? And they, it's important that they understand, you know, others who may not be as privileged and have the empathy for them, mm. understand that there is cause and effect, uh-huh. that they didn't choose the parents that they were born to, um, to be able to contrast um, those individuals that they've met through me or with me who perform and mm-hmm. that performance is not necessarily determining and defining who they really were as people mm-hmm. and individuals. Mm-hmm. So we get to talk about media and the influence of, uh, you know, perceptions of the media cast mm-hmm. versus what is reality mm-hmm. and the, um, the wonderful privilege of being able to research those things on their own and come mm-hmm. to their own conclusions. Mm-hmm. And then in their own way, devise strategies that they feel will be beneficial to their community mm-hmm. they care about. Come on, man. Mm-hmm. Come on. Um, so that's really kind of been my overarching uh, strategy. I do listen to a lot of talk radio when I'm driving with them. If I'm just tired of the music, you know, what have you. And I will often listen to political talk radio from other sides of the discussion mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that they can hear what the other is thinking. Right. or planning or plotting as well. Um, and I found that to be important. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's been a lot of trying to be uh, assertive with my exposure for the, my children, yeah. you know, emphasizing travel and all that you can learn in travel mm-hmm. um, and being able to have them observe, you know, these economic um, environments when they right. do travel of mm-hmm. people, indigenous people there compared to those who are living somewhat high off the hog because they're benefiting from the mm-hmm. labor of these others. Right. So um, they've been very intuitive. I found that they're very good in terms of selections and their own research and reading. Mm-hmm. And I've begun to tr- you know, trust them, honestly. Mm-hmm. Trust that, uh, that they're seeing the world for what it truly is. Mm-hmm. And they're not under some you know, guise or, or clouded vision of what is reality right. and for that understanding that you know um particularly i will say this is you know as a divorced father right mm-hmm. um 
I made it clear with my children it was going to be a team effort, right, going forward. Like, we're all in this together. The house got some needs, right? Then, then we got the needs, right? It's not just me as dad, but it's all of us pulling together, understanding we're in this. Right. And I, that was supported and supplemented by my community of group as well. Mm -hmm. So they've heard a lot and observed just from, you know, spending time out with dad, talking with my associates, colleagues, contemporaries, friends, and loved ones, and family. Mm -hmm. And so it's a communal effort. Um, and I think that in itself lends, their, uh, ben, lends them some better understanding as to, you know, what to do with their resources, you know, okay. uh, monetarily as well as uh, intellectually. Yeah. Thank you so much, all of you. I want to close out this conversation with Mama Rita, um, who I think their family, who I don't think there's anyone else better to close us out talking about the lack of family structure than Mama Rita because she has a family in uh, generations, right? So <laughs> she, she and her husband created a family, had three daughters, their three daughters, now they their family is growing. We're all, you know, planning to get there one day, right? Entrepreneurship so, in the family. Yeah, yes. entrepreneurship in the family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would love, Mama Rita, for you to just talk to us about what you learned about the importance of family structure, because one of the pervasive issues is lack of family structure. And we know that it does matter. That structure does matter. Consistency mm. does matter. We know that that's important. So please talk to us, close us out. And I, the last thing that I want to ask you to do is any advice you can share with Black parents in terms of how all Black parents, but especially the next generation, can help restore the community. Mm. Family structure and restoration. Okay, thank you. I, I'm just so thankful to hear the thoughts of the young parents and um, you know, it, it, when I listen to them talk, you know, especially you, Corinne, in the sense of, you know, the overall of what affects our community, yeah. it takes me back over the whole thing. Like, how do I get my kids to be aware? You know, how do I get my kids to be, you know, active and not participating in their own uh, oppression? You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. there's so many traps that, um, you know, the largest society sets up in different ways. And, um, you know, I wanted them to be aware of that. And the one thing that I realized that I wish I had done more of, because now as an, uh, them as adults, I really have to let them express to me, you know, um, what the, you know, what they want to talk about. I, I don't want to, I can't keep coming at them, you know, so, um, at this stage in, um, my parenting is about keeping quiet and listening, you mm. know? Um, but yeah, um, I, I have found that, you know, even whenever I was a kid, it was just um, so hard to see my mother and father, you know, um, at each other. And, um, you know, so I had gone on a journey to try to understand what men go through. And during my therapy, uh, after my mother died, um, I went on a historical search for my father's situation and realized why he was so, you know, violent in uh, the relationship with my mother. And I was able to forgive him, you know, <laughs> uh, and that forgiveness, you kind of forgive yourself. But um, at the same time and everything, the, the woman's group, which I, I can't say how much it helped me because it was other mothers in the community trying to hold each other up, give each other information. Um, and, um, you know, they really, you know, like, like we talked about the art of war, you know, <laughs> I mean, and there's a book called The Art of War mm -hmm. where you have to understand your enemy. You know, you have to understand, you know, um, you know, where he's coming from for you to, um, you know, have a, a constructive defense, okay? And um, uh, I give you the example, like, you know, um, we had the crash in 2008, 
and our community lost 50% of its value. Yeah. Uh, home ownership and thing. Um, there was a, a documentary by a uh, man, his name is Charles Ferguson. And he broke it down how the larger community, the banks, the financial institution, the mortgage companies, the title companies, the insurance companies, they mm -hmm. all came together to create a situation where you had subprime loans mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and targeted our community. Yes. And, um, it's really no different than um, back in the day, you know, like, which we just, I think was this year, yeah, that we had the Black Wall Street 100 year, mm -hmm. um, you know, celebration of the Greenwood community. Right. And how destroyed that community that was thriving. I mean, and that was just one of many. There were many Black townships that um, had, yeah. you know, that had, you know, progress, that were taking care of their families. They had education, they had hospitals for themselves. And they came and just, you know, destroyed. And it's been like that all along, you know, and what happened in 2008 is just what they've, they've done in a more sophisticated uh, way, but still it affect our community in a negative way, okay? <laughs> so um, my thing with the kids now is like how, you know, which I wish I had put more into them on how to fight these things, like understanding civics, you know, understanding how local, um, you know, officials that you vote for, that you can't just vote for them. You've got to call them and say, I want you to do this and that. And the same thing on national level, federal level with, you know, the president and vice president, you can't just put them in. Yeah, you can shoot them um, an email and say, look, you need to do more. You need to pass for the Voting Rights Act. You need to pass the George Floyd Policing Act, you know, and, and putting the pressures on that, you know, it's, and um, they're like, well, you know, I mean, not now, but there was a point that was like, well, mama, what do we do? You know, how, how can we do this? And uh, I had to be more strategic in the way that I helped them fight the larger community so that we could leave, you know, my children and my grandchildren um, a better world, so to yes. speak. Yeah, yes. definitely. Um, so for me, um, that, that part of, um, you know, our family and everything to me right now is, is, um, you know, trying to get them to realize, you know, it, it is hard to look at the facts of what is going on, but it's harder not to know, you know, because then you don't know who you're fighting and you don't know who you're you know, um, giving your money to? Are you giving your money to somebody that is, um, you know, oppressing your community? Are you giving your money to somebody that is fighting for your well-being and the well-being of your community at large? And, you know, you can only know these things with knowledge. And uh, what's that phrase? Um, knowledge will set you free, you know? <laughs> and the lack of knowledge, you'll repeat history. You know, and so, um, yeah. So for me, it's like uh, right now as a grandmother and a mother, I'm just trying to collect information on what's going on now. Like I listen to Roland Martin, you know, uh, Joe Madison on Sirius XM, uh, Professor Hunter, uh, Al Sharpton. You know, oh. the people have the pulse on what is actually going on, who the players are, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, like for one thing, like um, the miseducation of the Negro Carter Woodson. Mm -hmm. Like, I know when I listen to Tim Scott, a black man that talks like a white man mm -hmm. that is working against our community. Um, I know that he has been miseducated and his education did not you know, is not benefiting our community, you know? <laughs> um, 
you know, just for like one example. And I want I wanted to make sure that my children's education and their fi financial prosperity would be benefiting our community and making the world a better place for our children and um, their nieces and nephews. Thank you, babe. Um, so, you know, for me, that, that seems to be where my journey is now. Yeah. Um, and then passing that on to them because they're working every day. They're being parents, you know, <laughs> they're trying to keep, um, you know, all, all that they have going afloat and their kids educated. So now I'm the one bringing information that they don't really have time to, to really listen to mm, wow. or to strategize on, you know? Mm. And uh, I see for me in our foundation right now and the relationship that we have uh, going on with each other where that's kind of my position is right now, you know, is to, um, you know, make sure that, uh, my children are aware of who is doing what in the community hmm. and who is doing, not doing, and who you need to be supporting hmm. because of what they're doing in the community. So um, I didn't, I told them when they were in school that I don't, and I think I even mentioned this at one of the uh, benefactors um, dinners, is that you're not going to school just to increase your uh, pros your own personal prosperity oh, and your own, um, you know, your own money. Okay, you are you're also going to school to uh, nurture your community and yeah. the prosperity yeah. in your community. Yeah. Yes. Because my children, they would look at Third Street and they'd be like, wow, mom, why, you know, why do they do this or why do they do that? And I was brought up in the Bayview too. And I remember when they had the riots, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, something happened to a young man uh, near Third and Revere. And we lived on Revere Street, but I lived on the side where the Navy Yard is. And um, mm -hmm. so the People, people were coming, the Navy Yard was still, you know, very much uh, working at the time. The, uh, and I, the people were coming through in their cars and the older kids were throwing rocks at them, okay? Uh, because of this young man that had got killed on Third and Revere. And they also had tore up some of Third Street. And you know, I, I wanted to know why, you know, um, you know, why, you know, they were, we were tearing up like our own community and everything. And um, uh, my mother said something about they were, uh, they were, I don't know if she said they were misinformed or they were uh, mis the misplaced hostilities, I think it's mm. what she said, you know. And I, I was around 11 you know, at the time and everything. So when I ran across Dr. Um, Carter Woodson's book, The Miseducation of the Negro, and he was saying in there that they were training our kids and training the Native Americans to not solve problems for their community, hmm. their own community, wow. but to solve problems for basically what he was saying, the plantation, hmm. okay? <laughs> Like our system is a big plantation. And if you are not aware of, you know, you know, uh, yourself and the love that you have for yourself, you can be working against your own people, mm. solving problems for the plantation and not for your yes. own community you know, yes. and um, I wanted to make sure that my kids understood, you know, the difference between the two. Mm. And um, I've, I've tried to make sure that they got examples and everything as they have grown up to that fact. And uh, whenever I was giving a talk at the Benefactors Dinner, I remember saying too that we always have to remember our ancestors and what they've gone through. And a lot of 
people, you know, like I don't look at our history starting just when we came to the United States. You know, our history spans way long before we ever were enslaved here in the United States. And so, you know, my, my reality of that isn't, you know, cut off. And so whenever I look at enslavement, I look at the resiliency that our people have. And I am so proud of their resiliency and their strength in much more oppressive conditions than mm -hmm. what we live now. Wow. And I want to make them proud of what yeah. I contribute to the community while I'm still, you know, on this earth and haven't transitioned yet myself. So um, I wanted to make sure that I instilled in them that um, you should be proud of what your people have done, okay? Mm -hmm. And that we're still here because we would not be here yes. without their love. And uh, I, I heard, um, I think it was Karen Hunter that was saying, uh, Professor Hunter that was saying, um, you got to have that Harriet Tubman love, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> where you not only save yourself, but you go back and you reach out and you try to, you know, say someone else. And yes. for me, the, the boys club was a perfect example of that, you know, too. Yes. And uh, also me honoring the, the women that helped me after my mother died whenever I was 19. Mm -hmm. mm. So, um, yeah, so this is, you know, this is the foundation that I want my children and that I'm sure that they are pretty clear on. <laughs> They'll tell me, mama, you know, we your child, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have to forget, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I was saying earlier in this conversation that I have to try to sometimes just be quiet, mm -hmm. you know, because just like uh, when they went away to school and my husband had to remind me, you know, like, look, we put a lot in them. Yeah. You know, we have extended family and then you had the boys club input. They're going to be OK. You know, they're going to be OK. So, yeah. 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 Oh, and I wanted to clarify uh, the book, Developing Positive Self Images and uh, Discipline in Black Children was uh, Jawafu. Jawafu. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That was the gonna... first black scholar. I that was the first book I read by a black scholar in at the College of Alameda. <laughs> yes, and you mentioned it in our class. You mentioned it in our class. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was gonna ask. Um, I was gonna ask Mama Rita if you don't mind. Maybe you could. Um, or you could provide. Um, you guys can probably maybe provide it in the email as a follow up or something. Just those books that um, you had mentioned, and also the books that Chris had mentioned. And then Absolutely. I also had a few books that talks about like criminalization of yeah. black boys and stuff. So I will send those over in the email as well. Yes. And I when I will list every book mentioned today. We'll we're going to list it, uh, provide it in the description at the bottom of the video as well. Okay. Okay. Well, so Dio had we, his hand. Dio, get ready because we're going to come to you. I know you have your hand up. So let me 60 give you, seconds, you guys. I'm going to give you 60 a, seconds. Can you do it? <laughs> yeah. So, Dio, be ready. hold up, Dio. Be ready so I can give you a chance to get your thoughts together. Mama Rita, I just wanted to say um, when you were speaking, I thought of the fact that you were speaking as a Proverbs 31 woman, a woman who looks over the affairs of her household and who considers what they have, what they need, and what needs to be done mm. to make sure that they can soar as eagles. So I just wanted to share that. You said, you said something to the degree that uh, it's harder, it's hard to, to look at the horrors of life. And they talk about that because it's all over, it's everywhere, but it's even harder to not be aware of the traps that are in front of our children, that, that not be aware of the oppressive systems mm -hmm. that, be, that are before them and not be, of the where, not be aware of the ways that they can create positive change for themselves in a the community. Mm -hmm. So Diane, we're coming to you. And then after that, we're gonna wrap this up. Mm -hmm. Was it something you wanted to share, Diane? Say well, just listening to Mama Rita, uh, you know, I think spoke to a lot of that value set that uh, I think 
not only keeps families intact, but um, allows especially young children to make decisions when we're not present, when we're not being able to, you know, kind of be there over them every, you know, moment. And um, it's certainly even in regards to how we perceive money or economics mm -hmm. is very important as well. Yeah. And so that shaped for me as a father, um, kind of some of the marching orders that I gave my kids, mm -hmm. right? Uh, just learning how to save. Um, but then also, you know, that money just being one uh, rule of measure, really, right? Um, and so other areas that maybe needed to be uh, given some priority in life as well. And then how do you make one feed the other or work with the mm -hmm. other? Um, so that's just really important. And that kind of resonated me, with me listening to Mama Rita here um, talk about more or less the principles, right? These concepts that were put in place. Um, yeah. That as a father, when you are somewhat fearful about the future, you know, uh, enables you to rest maybe a little bit better, uh, right? Understand that they have the same value sets and perspective on uh, things that may be coming their way, right? But yet uh, unseen. Wow. This teaching is, this our is kids amazing. how to save yeah. and teaching them how to think about what to do with the money they earn, mm -hmm. where to allocate it, mm -hmm. and the responsibilities they have to the community. Yep. That's good. You want me to go ahead and wrap this up? Yeah, and okay. I'll just say thank you, and then we're, we're oh, out. Then we'll be out. All right. <laughs> so when I was trained in how to speak, there were three basic <laughs> things you had to do. You tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. <laughs> so now I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them what you all just told them because uh, you want to make sure these parents don't don't forget. Because a lot of people are going to be listening to this and watching this video. We're going to blow this thing out there and yeah. put this on blast. So we started out in this second session talking about ways to combat negativity, and there was mention of the Alive and Free Omega Boys Club which is a historic organization in San Francisco and constantly referencing the importance of, you know, parents, if you're looking for some principles, you know, to help guide you and instill in your children, just, I think it was at staying stay alive and free. Mm -hmm. Stayaliveandfree.org. .org or Google alive and free, and you'll be able to go to that website and find out more about that. And just the mention of the film study, the value of film study and yes. defining what a friend is and having conversations, the conversations that can help, you know, help them make sense of life and how they see themselves in the world, helping them develop their vision for themselves and, and how they're going to move forward in building their worldview and, 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 and being aggressive about that and not allowing someone else to define their worldview for them. And then, and then building awareness about social issues. And affirming, and the fact that you say, as a parent, affirm their ideas. Don't judge them. They may be half baked, but affirm them. And at the same time, acknowledge and support them in further developing their ideas. Mm -hmm. But yeah. don't, don't send a message to them that they don't have what it takes and that they're not able. We never want to send that message mm -hmm. to our children. Mm -hmm. And then having confidence. I heard, you know, having confidence in the law, in the law of sowing and reaping, mm -hmm. believing, like you said, your husband said, Mama Rita, hey, the things we sold in them, they have to sprout. And we got to have patience and believe that those things are going to come. They're going to realize it, but we got to give them time mm -hmm. to make sense of life and learn. And then talk, we moved to talk about the five issues, the issues that they've that a lot of Black families and communities are facing, mm -hmm. you know, racism, mass incarceration, right? And talking about, hey, we need to educate our children uh, about themselves and, and about culture and history and the realities of life. Don't shield them from it, but help them to make sense of it and also educate them about the opportunities that are before them. Mm -hmm. So you can do that through car chronicles. You can do that through table conversations. You can do that through a lot of different ways, but be purposefully intentional mm -hmm. about, without apology, about helping them build their perspective, their sense of self, mm -hmm. and, and then the importance of balancing 
providing for your child mm -hmm. with also rearing your child. Don't just be a provider, but also rear them and, and be intentional about that. And then seizing the time while you can, mm -hmm. while they're still willing to listen to us and they have to listen to us, <laughs> seize that time and, and sow into them. And, and being actively aggressive and unapologetic about the fact that we are socializing them. That's right. And the schools, they're partners in the socialization. We don't turn over that responsibility of socializing our children 100% to the schools. No, they're partners in that, mm -hmm. all right? And then uh, we talked about uh, Black empowerment and the importance of self-preservation and understanding the fact that, look, there's oppression, there are sources of power that they need to be aware of, and having to develop, helping them develop a sense of community and what community resources that are out there that are available to them. And then developing a, a value of the exposure to a parent's social group. Mm -hmm. Make, helping them become aware of the relationships that we have and inviting them into the conversations, telling them about the conversations, allowing them to meet some of the people that we know mm -hmm. and build a relationship with them because they can also help us be partners in raising and rearing our children. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, knowing, knowing, helping them to learn what it means to be responsible, to be an earner, to be an entrepreneur, right? To develop a social perspective, to have an ethic of care. I think you heard about that mentioned in your class by Dr. Necker, an, an ethic of the importance of an ethic of care and, and, and developing a sense of, of, of empathy for others mm -hmm. and goodwill towards your fellow man and fellow, fellow man and fellow woman. And, and then the fact that, look, it matters to have a, an understanding about the role of finances in the community and how you can, you can use this, this, this literacy, financial literacy to help create change and build wealth in the community. Then I heard, look, trust your children. Listen to them, give them a chance to talk. Give them a chance to, to develop their ideas, to, to make meaning, to, to, to think out loud about what they're experiencing, what they're seeing, and and and, and then moving, and you know, because that helps when you're building your family structure and you're talking about building a, a willingness and a regard and a framework for them to restore the community. So you're building that aware, awareness and helping them to not participate in self-destruction and, mm -hmm. and oppressive behavior, mm -hmm. and and letting them think out loud, understanding. Look, understand who your enemy is. Enemies are not always tan physical. They can be intangible. They can be systems. They can be ideas. They can be historic things. Uh, they can be things that dwell within the self. So knowing what that enemy and is and how to so right, how to combat that, and the importance of understanding, you know, the importance of civics and developing a perspective on community engagement, how to be involved in the community and engaged. And, and, and politics and taking political action. So I just wanted to share and summarize that stuff. It was amazing, it's great. And those of you who are watching this video, you're gonna probably wanna go back and listen to this again, because this was amazing. It's about every time you all were speaking, I was getting chills. So you can go ahead and take it away and wrap. <laughs> <laughs> so family. Chris always says, and, it, it, and, and I got to say, since we're talking about parenting and talking about children, I, I have to give a shout out to our youngest daughter. She is launching her own brand. And um, <laughs> one of the shirts that she designed has the word family on it. And she redefined it based on something her dad says all the time. He says, when he shows a photo of his family, he says, behold, my greatest accomplishment in life. Mm. So she designed a t-shirt that says family and the definition is your greatest accomplishment in life. Why am mm. I saying that? Because you all are leaving the world better than you found it. And that is with your greatest accomplishment in life. Yeah. 
Thank you all so much for taking this time to speak to us. Corinne, get ready because I'm inviting you back. <laughs> <laughs> so we will have a, another conversation. We've already invited Dio back. Mama Rita, oh my. Thank you said so much. You really needed your own hour and a half. Like we could have all just sat and listened to you. We need to hear, we need to hear more from Mama Rita's and we need to hear more from fathers in the community. So this will not be the last time you will get, we, the listeners and, and people watching will get an opportunity to hear, hear from elders in the community. We need to amplify their voices. So it's going to be my mission to do that. Again, thank you all so much. I love each of you. We love each of you, Corinne.